Good morning. Welcome to our members and our visitors, to those with us in person, those who are shipping with us online at Mount Calvary. This is the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, this morning's service will follow the service of morning praise. It begins on page 45 in the front of our hymnal. We'll turn to that after the uh, singing of our opening hymn, hymn 443. As it is the first Sunday of the month, we'll be viewing the August edition of the Wells Connection, and then we'll have the ring of the bells and get into our service with the opening hymn. The service theme today, uh, as you'll see through the readings and the hymns, um, is that we put our trust in the Lord. And we as Christians, of course, know to do that, um, both in the good times and also in the difficult times as well. So we'll begin with the August Wells Connection and then have the ringing of the bells. President Mark Schrader. Generations ago, when churchgoers went to worship on foot or on horseback, it was important for there to be a large number of churches in a relatively small area. Today, times are changing, and so is the need for Wells churches to be located very close to one another. With snow-covered steps, this old church building that lacks a sign hasn't been used for worship for a number of years. Our membership was getting older and older, and our Sunday school was dwindling. As a third generation member of this former Wells congregation, known as St. John's, Lon Heisey didn't want to see his lifelong church home close. I was just didn't want to let go like like a lot of people you just you don't want to let go of those memories you, you don't know what the future is st john's and another area church both had pastoral vacancies for two years the pastor of a third nearby wells church served either as the pastor or vacancy pastor for all three churches during that time he said to them it is one of the twelve one who is dipping with me in the dish we approached them about merging, um, started that process. And one of the things I really learned early on in that was that it wasn't just deep-seated emotions in the conversation, but there was a lot of you know, deep faith that was involved as well. They looked at their church and that was their physical connection to God in many ways. This is the church where they were baptized, where their children were baptized, where they were confirmed, where their children were confirmed. These three churches within a six mile radius from each other merged into a single ministry. Mergers like this aren't just happening in these old country churches but also in hustling and bustling metropolitan areas, where these three Milwaukee area congregations are within two miles from each other. We just found that although there, there was a level of cooperation already, there was you know a little bit of competition too. And from a ministry standpoint, how can we be most efficient in our area to you know to deliver the gospel message to the people in the West Dallas area? And we determined that it would be better together as opposed to better separately to do that. Unified under a new name, Living Hope, their schools will also be merging into one. I think it, it gives us a lot more options. You know, some people ha always have like a little bit of a negative connotation with like a small, well, school. Like you can't offer as much because it's smaller. Now we're going to single grade per class. We have a lot more options and it gives us an area, a larger area, so we're not kind of fighting ourselves. Their short-term plan is to have all church operations at one site and the school at another. Their next step is to unify onto a single campus. I think the biggest challenge when you have healthy congregations is to convince the congregations that you can do things better together. Why do we need to do this? That was probably the biggest question we had to answer as it led up to the vote is, why are we better together? And we really had to put a good plan together for that, and I think we did. 
Even though the St. John's and Zion church buildings have closed, that does not mean it's a loss for Christ's work in that area. In fact, the merger is allowing more gospel ministry to happen. And now we're working towards calling a second pastor and how much more we can do having two pastors in one place rather than having two pastors in two places. Having two pastors will allow them to better share the good news of Jesus in the newest aspect of their ministry, an early childhood center for infants through five-year-olds. All right, let's see, what were we talking about today? I think it got people a little bit more fired up and excited because it wasn't like, oh, I'm adding into this, or oh, I guess this is somebody else's ministry aspect. But it was all new, so then able to just bring in new people and different volunteers. For me, it's a, it's a building, it's not a church. It's just the building, the church is the people. It's not the more congregations we have, the healthier we are, but it's the more gospel ministry we do uh, is what gives Christ glory. So if we can do more ministry with, even with fewer congregations, that's perfectly fine. So congregational consolidation is a good option for many moving forward. We're thankful that God allows us to play a role in his gospel sharing efforts. May he continue to allow us to serve his kingdom in a God-pleasing way as he builds his church.
Please rise. O oh Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O oh God. The Spirit of the Lord fills the world. Let us worship Him. Please be seated for our psalm this morning. Today we turn to page 102 in the front of the hymnal for psalm number 96. We'll sing the verses and the refrain to psalm 96.
This morning's epistle lesson is taken from the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, beginning with the third verse. The apostle gives us that comforting knowledge that our salvation was determined not by us or by anything we did, but by God himself, even before he created the world. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He did this when he chose us in Christ, before the foundation of the world, so that we would be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. He did this in accordance with the good purpose of his will, and for the praise of his glorious grace, which he has graciously given us in the one he loves. In him, we also have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in keeping with the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will in keeping with his good purpose, which he planned in Christ. This was to be carried out when the time had fully come, in order to bring all things together in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. This ends our epistle lesson. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel is taken from St. Matthew in chapter 14, beginning with the 13th verse. Here we have Matthew's account of the feeding of the 5,000. And for those of you who are Bible trivia fans, please note this is the only miracle of our Savior that is recorded in all four of the Gospels. When Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place to be alone. When the crowds heard this, they followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus got out of the boat, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. When evening came, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the crowds away, so they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. They told him, We have here only five loaves and two fish. Bring them here to me, he replied. Then he instructed the people to sit down in the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish. After looking up to heaven, he blessed them. He broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. The disciples gave the food to the people. They all ate and were filled. They picked up 12 basketfuls of what was left over from the broken pieces. Those who ate were about 5,000 men, not even counting women and children. This ends our gospel lesson. We join in the seasonal response printed in our worship folder. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Please be seated for the hymn of the day, hymn number 236.
How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, for our meditation this morning, we turn our attention to the Old Testament lesson taken from 1 Kings chapter 17. Elijah from Tishba, one of the settlers in Gilead, said to Ahab, As surely as the Lord lives, the God of Israel before whom I stand, there will be no dew or rain during the coming years, except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Leave this place and turn east. Hide yourself by the Kirith Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the stream, and I will command the ravens to provide food for, provide for you there. So Elijah went and did just as the Lord had said. He lived in the Kirith Ravine, east of the Jordan. The ravens brought, brought him bread and meat in the morning and in the evening, and he drank from the stream. This is the word of our Lord. Dear friends in Jesus Christ, our Lord, on the back of a $1 bill are the words, In God We Trust, right there. They're also on the back of a 5, a 10, and every other piece of paper currency that we have. They are there because in 1957, then Treasury Secretary George Humphreys thought it would be a good idea to put them there. They'd been on all of America's coinage since about the time of the Civil War. And in July of the previous year, President Eisenhower had signed into law a bill which made In God We Trust the official motto of the United States of America. I don't imagine there's any one of us here today who would disagree with these words, who would object to them being anywhere. In fact, we might say, yeah, that's kind of my motto too. In God, I trust. For us as children of God, the phrase, in God we trust, is more than a motto. It's how we live our life, recognizing two things. That God himself is in control, so we trust in him. And that God himself always takes care of his people. And so why not trust in him? Elijah found those words to be true, that in God he trusted. A little background to 1 Kings 17. Elijah is introduced to us in this chapter, one of God's foremost Old Testament prophets. He served in the northern kingdom. Ahab, as we are told, was king at the time. The northern kingdom of Israel, ten tribes that had broken away from the other two after the death of Solomon and the ascension of his son, Rehoboam, who imposed rules that the northern tribes did not like, and so one of their members, a man named Jeroboam, told them, let's leave this association of our brothers and sisters, our fellow Jews, and form our own nation. We'll make the city of Samaria our capital. We'll worship God there. And so they did. And over the years, that northern collection of ten tribes drifted further and further away from God. And then along came Ahab, of whom it is said in 1 Kings 16, Ahab, son of Omri, committed more evil in the eyes of the Lord than all those who had gone before him. <laughs> not exactly a ringing endorsement, is it, of a man who claimed to be one of God's people. Ahab had many faults. Among them, he had married a foreign woman, Jezebel, whose father was the king of Sidon. And with Jezebel, Ahab brought into Israel the prolific worship of the false gods Baal and Ashtoreth, the goddess. And Baal was considered by the people of Sidon and then Ahab and the people of Israel who adopted the worship of him. Baal was considered to be the god of rain, fertility, and crops. Worship services were, were horrible experiences. But he was the one thought to have control over the kind of things that produced good crops in the fields, large herds and flocks. 
And so God, in his wisdom, sent Elijah to this wicked king and said, in, a, in essence, uh, well, I'm really the one in control of things. And to prove that to you, there will be no more rain in Israel until I say differently. And so it was. The drought began. God was definitely in control. It wasn't Baal. He was just a statue, a figment of human imagination. God, on the other hand, is real. And God is the one who is in control of everything. And so while the Israelites put their trust in a statue, Elijah, a few people in the northern kingdom and more in the southern kingdom, put their trust in God, the true God. And we see that was wise to do. Because God took care of the situation. And we might wonder, well, why would God do this? Because after all, there were faithful people in the northern kingdom. And the drought wasn't confined to just that little area. It spread elsewhere, too. And there were godly people in the south. Why would God allow his people to suffer because of this wicked king? Well, we can't know all the mind of God beyond what he reveals to us in the scriptures. But certainly God is using this event, it would seem, to call the people, those faithful to him, who were still themselves sinners, who may not have worshipped Baal, but there were other things they did that God would not approve of. And those who did worship Baal, God is using this to call them to repentance. And that is an example of his mercy as he acts in the lives of people. He could have wiped them out. He could have simply destroyed them and shown his power. But instead, he chose to be merciful and to call them back. And so he allowed this drought to take place with the idea that maybe, just maybe, some people will wake up and realize that they'd been wrong to follow the god of Baal, the false god, Baal. God is still in control of the world today. We wouldn't know that if we watched the news, read the paper, listened to the radio, read the internet. We would think that no one's in control. We might even be led to think we're in control. In our weather, we experience droughts. We experience times of deluge. Parts of our nation have experienced heat waves. Others, tornadoes and flooding rains. And some people would give you the impression and give us all the impression that we better do something about that. And that we have the power to actually do something about that. Now, to be sure, God wants us to be good stewards of our world. And so we want to conserve our resources and we don't want to waste anything. But to imagine that our behavior is somehow going to make our world a more wonderful place. That we have the power to alter the weather. Maybe going a little too far. And yes, human history has shown that mankind, when we're not being good stewards of the world, we can do quite a bit of damage. It used to be we poured all kinds of industrial waste into our waterways. We've cleaned a lot of that up. Are there things we could do differently? Perhaps. But maybe, maybe those heat waves, those torrential rains, those cold snaps, maybe that's not coming because of anything human beings are doing or not doing. Maybe those things come because God himself is once again, in his goodness and mercy, calling us to repentance. Calling us not to bow the knee at any false god, Baal or otherwise, but to turn to him and to him alone as the only source of help and as the only supreme being that there is. And that we are mere creatures of his, no matter how important we may think we are. In God we trust because God is in control, always has been, always will be. 
But there's more to it than just his dominant control. He uses that for the good of his people as he provides for them, as he did for Elijah. He sent him away east of the Jordan River to the Kirith Ravine. And he said, I'm going to take care of you, Elijah. Obviously, the ravine had a stream that ran through it, so that would be his water source. And then his food would come from a most unusual place. God was going to use ravens to bring him bread and meat, morning and evening. If you've ever had food delivered to your door, you know that that can be quite convenient. Might come in a box, might come ready for you to cook. Does not come from a bird of carrion, does it? Would not come from a scavenger bird. And yet that's exactly what God sent. Didn't send him doves. Didn't send him pigeons to deliver the food. Sent him ravens. Birds which aren't known for sharing. But again, God in his care for his people altered the natural course of the way these ravens would act. We would see a raven picking over a carcass. Another raven lands and the first one tries to chew it away, takes its piece of food and goes off to eat it by itself, not wanting to share with anything. But here God used these ravens to bring Elijah food. Probably not picked off a dead carcass either, but better food than that. And they get it, gave it to him twice a day for several days all the way until the stream itself dried up. And then God took care of Elijah by sending him to another area, to a widow, through whom God miraculously provided for the prophet and the widow and her son with oil and flour that never ran out, despite the small amount in the jar. Now God may not take care of you and me in such dramatic and miraculous ways. But he does take care of us. Our gardens produce abundantly. Our world is able to produce enough food for the seven point whatever billion of us that there are. God has blessed agricultural science with an ability to grow more food on less space than we've ever had the technology to do. And there are people in our world who are hungry. There are many who go without food. Sometimes that's because of a natural disaster. Sometimes that's because of political unrest and war. Sometimes it's because of the particular local government that is tyrannical and cruel. All of those are the result of sin in a broken world. But yet God still provides for his people. It is not God's fault that tyrants keep food from getting to their citizens. It's not God's fault that wars break out. It is not God's fault that some farmers don't practice good agricultural practices. God has given his people enough food to eat, clothes to wear, and kept a roof over their heads. He's done that for you and for me too. And so in God we trust because God cares for his people. But let's be honest with ourselves. Sometimes it's easier to trust God than at other times. When I have a lot of these little bills that say it, it might be easier to trust in God. When I have a bill that has a couple of zeros after the one, lots of those, then it might be a little easier to trust God, isn't it? Be honest with yourself. As you saw your bank account go down, as you heard about company layoffs coming, as you saw the price increases at the store of, well, just about everything, did you begin to wonder, uh-oh, we're going to have to be more careful. I'm going to have to do something different. And maybe we do have to be better stewards. Maybe we have to plan more wisely. I don't know. But we ought not to stop trusting in God. Because the same God who blesses us when we have a lot of those bills in our pocket is the same God who will bless us when we have none of those bills in our pocket. A Christian woman once told me she kept a penny underneath the mat on her car floor driver's side. And she told me, Pastor, I keep that penny there for one reason. 
She said, if all of the rest of my money is gone, I'll at least not be broke. I'll have a penny. I asked her what she intended to do with it. She had no idea, but she knew she just wouldn't be broke. And on her penny, like on your pennies, it says, in God we trust, around the bottom. But of course, she trusted in God to take care of her. And we can too, because he always has. He always will. When the money is there, trust in God, not the money. When the money isn't there, trust in God, not what you can see or can't see, but what we believe. In God we trust. Catchy, isn't it? Four short words, easily memorized, makes a great national motto. For the longest time, I didn't even know it was their national motto. I didn't even know we had a national motto. But that's it. Has been since 1956. Some of you were around even before that. When it wasn't the national motto, you maybe didn't recall a big change in the country when we went from no motto to that motto. But in God we trust for you and for me is not just a motto. It's a way of life. It's a way of life that ought to be our guiding principle while we're here on earth because it's going to be the guiding principle that sees us through to eternal life. Since the Pentecost season, these banners have been hanging on our church. They'll be here through about the month of November. One of them tells us to trust in the Lord. <clears throat> That's a nice banner. It ought to do more than just hang in a church. It ought to hang in our hearts and in our lives. It ought to be first and foremost in our minds, in good days and in bad days, because it is truly in God that we trust. And because of that, we can be sure and certain of our future, here on earth and forever in heaven. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We respond to the word of God by singing hymn number 480 in our hymnal, hymn 480.
Please rise as the offering is brought forward. Our Savior, give us grace to lovingly and unselfishly dedicate ourselves and our possessions for use in your kingdom. Mindful of our shortcomings and sins, we bring this offering to your altar in a spirit of meekness and repentance. Forgive us for all of the times that we have been uncharitable, greedy, or selfish, and open our hearts to give to you in love, as in love you gave yourself for us. Hear us to the glory of your name. Amen. Our service continues on page 50 in the front of the hymnal with the Kyrie. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. we join to pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Dear Father in heaven, in your tender love you have given us great and precious promises as your children. Preserve us from the doubts that might assail us and increase our faith. When life puzzles or disturbs us, when issues arise in our lives that could cause us to question your love for us, Teach us to fix our eyes on Jesus and to stand firm in the assurance of his promise to uphold and to deliver us. We ask this in his name. Amen. Special prayer is offered this morning on behalf of Mr. David Smith, who remains hospitalized, and also Mr. Stephen Bergston, who was hospitalized this past week, uh, both of whom are doing well, but uh, will be in the hospital for a little while yet at least. We pray. Dear Lord, you are the great physician of soul and body. You chasten and you heal. We pray that you would look with mercy upon your servants, David Smith and Stephen Bergston, in their time of illness. If it be your will, spare their lives and restore them to strength. You gave your son to bear our infirmities and sicknesses, and we pray that you would deal compassionately with your servants and bless the medical means employed on their behalf with your healing power. We commit them to your gracious mercy and protection, for you are a faithful and merciful God. And Lord, your ears are always open to the prayers of your humble servants who come to you in Jesus' name. Teach us always to ask according to your will that we may never fail to obtain the blessings which you have promised. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please be seated for the closing hymn.
Thank you for being with us today. Thank you to our greeters, to our ushers, to our organist for their work in our service as well. As you leave this morning, if you have not yet done so, you're welcome to take the August copy of the Forward in Christ magazine from the back of church. As always, many fine articles are in it this month. Also, please notice in your parish notes some of the upcoming events in the next couple of weeks here. Uh, next Sunday, uh, the 13th, we will have the Vacation Bible School students uh, singing as part of the service. We will also have the installation of Mrs. Clara Handy as our new preschool, uh, four-year-old preschool and kindergarten teacher. Um, this morning, we had hoped to show you a video from the Philippines, an update from the work that is done there. However, due to technical problems, mostly on my end, uh, that was not possible. So we'll try to show that next Sunday as well. Um, then two weeks from today, on the 20th, please make remember um, and tell all your friends and relatives who aren't here today but really wanted to be, that church will be at 10 o'clock in two weeks. Not at 9 o'clock, but at 10 o'clock <clears throat> that day. And then at 11 o'clock, we'll have our church, pic <clears throat> excuse me, our church picnic, uh, hopefully outside, but if not, we'll have it indoors, uh, depending on the weather. You may eat, if it is nice, either inside or outside. Uh, this morning, the weather is nice, so you're welcome to some fellowship and refreshments on the front sidewalk as immediately after church. On your way out there, please take a note to, the, to your left as you leave. Uh, lots of nice vegetables were brought in again today, so you're welcome to take some of those uh, with you. Uh, and uh, some of you have already done a little shopping out there, but if you have not, you're welcome to grab something from our little local farmer's market before you head home today. Again, we thank you for your time with us. Oh, uh, Mr. Biedenbender has a question. Uh, not a question. Oh. Just uh, announcing that uh, the towns welcomed Aurora Lynn Town, six pounds, six ounces, yesterday about 11.30, 10.30. So congratulations to Town. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all.